Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of the SD40-2 build, model building start to finish. This is John, I'm sitting here with Dan looking at the SD40-2, that's so close. Yeah. <laughs> Not yes. much left. No. Um, so last time I installed the cab interior and the number boards and a bunch of lights. And a speaker. And a speaker. Um, so today... Uh, I want to finish up installing the lights and install the decoder and get everything wired up and hopefully get this thing running. This is a Loke Sound Select decoder. This is the six function version with the eight pin plug on it, uh, part number 73400. And since this engine doesn't have a DCC socket, we don't really need the plug, so I'm going to just cut that off. This is how I know when you're getting serious. Yeah. So I should mention that you can buy these decoders preloaded with the sound set that you want for whatever engine you're installing them into. Um, this one is not loaded with any sound since I have my own uh, Loke programmer box and the software on my computer. I'm going to do it myself. So I made another thing. It looks kind of like the same thing I made to start the speaker enclosure. Yeah, I thought you were going to put another speaker in. <laughs> no. Um, this is another piece of 040 styrene with a couple of 040 by 040 uh, little rails, I guess you could call them, on either edge. And and a great brush paint job. Yeah, really, really award-winning uh, black paint job. Um, the purpose of this is to make sure that no light from any of the LEDs that go inside the model are going to shine through the dynamic brake fans. Oh, yeah, that would be very unprototypical. Yeah, so this is going to go like this with the black facing toward the fan openings, and then I'll glue it in there right below the fans. I've positioned the decoder right here, right behind the cab on the roof, and I haven't actually glued it in there, and I'm not going to do that, actually. I'll Was just it, leave it loose. This is just test fitting? Being. or No, that's where it's going to be, but um, I'll secure it later, and I'll show you how I'll do that later. But um, for now, that's a good place for it and I can start making the connections. Okay, so before I start making connections in the shell, I also want to get the chassis ready. And way back when I first put this together, I kind of left it in this condition. Uh, it's got the gray and orange wires coming off the motor, which is fine. But then I've got two sets of red wires on the engineer's side of each truck and two sets of black wires. So... What I want to do basically is to splice these together and leave one lead that'll go up into the shell. Right. Okay. Yeah, because you want all the track power all on the same side, right? Right. And the same thing with the red ones. So I'm going to cut one of these shorter, actually cut both of them shorter, uh, splice them together, and then splice in a lead that goes up like this. And those are going to go to the decoder, right? Right. Because the four most important wires in any decoder installation are the track power and the motor. So for this kind of a splice, what I usually do is twist two of the wires together and then tin them with some solder. And then I also tin the end of the other wire. And then I can solder these together. And I've already slipped a piece of heat shrink tubing over this. There it is. And I'll just put that there and then heat it up to just make sure it's all insulated. So I've cut all these wires to the same length and I've also put a couple pieces of heat shrink tubing around the whole thing. Was that just to keep it together? Or? It's just to keep it together. Um, I'm trying to make a little, kind of like a little cable yeah. that goes up into the engine. Yeah, it's like a snake. Right. And as far as these wires go, there's a little slack, but not too much. And the most, uh, the thing I'm most concerned about with these is I don't want them to rub on the drive shafts or on the flywheels because sometimes that makes noise. Yeah. Um, so hopefully we'll be able to put it together. But doing something like this makes it a little easier to put the shell on later. Yeah, sure. I could see that because otherwise it would be a big thing of spaghetti. Right. All right. So I've spliced all the connections from the track power and the motor to the decoder. And uh, I noticed on this particular decoder that the white wire and the gray wire are 
kind of close in color. So it, <laughs> um, the gray wire is very pale. In other words, is what I'm trying to say. So um, make sure not to mix those up. <laughs> well, what's the gray usually for? The gray is for the motor. The white is a is a light. Oh, okay. So yeah, you, don't you really do don't that. want to cross those. I like to connect up the track power and the motor power, and then put the engine on a track and see if it runs in the right direction. That's a good idea because you might have it reversed or something. Right. right, and I know there's a CV you can change to fix that, but I really like to get it right in the wiring. This is one of the moments of truth. This right? is a moment of truth. Ready to see it run under its own power? Uh, okay. There it goes, and it's going forward. Is it so? It's connected properly. Yeah. Oh, so if you were Doctor Frankenstein right now, you would be exclaiming, "How it's alive!" Huh? Right, I would. <laughs> Anyway, obviously, or, I'm not going to run it too far. And you want to be really careful when you're doing this. Not, make sure none of these wires are touching anything and don't hit any of the light buttons because you don't want to turn any of that stuff on. It's important to use resistors on all of the light function the outputs. And that is because, what, are they too strong? It's basically track power. And an LED will fry if you give it track power without a resistor. Okay. So you don't want to do that. Um, so I'm using a 1K ohm. Uh, resistor here. This is the headlight, the white wire. Well, I have a question here. How do you decide what strength of resistor you want to use? I mean, don't do you have to test it and like put a resistor on and look at it and then test it again? Or um, you can, and I've seen some people. I guess they maybe have more of an engineering background. Try to give formulas and things. Really, just use a one k ohm resistor for headlights. Or a 750 ohm resistor for headlights, it works just fine. Yeah, I seem to remember you using a 750 before. Yeah, 750 or 1K is pretty close. And honestly, the difference in brightness, I don't think you could even tell with your naked eye. Yeah. So I'm using 1K in this case just for a little bit of extra safety margin. Yep. So what do you have there? The You have the, the resistor and you're going to heat shrink the... Right. And then I got to connect the other end of the resistor to the white wire from the headlight that we installed in the last episode. Okay, so this wire's from the decoder, the decoder and you're connecting it to the, okay. To this wire over here Yeah, um, from the headlight. Now, it's always a trade-off in doing these. Uh, ideally, you'd want to keep your wire runs as short as possible. Mm -hmm. But if you did that, unless you can get yourself shrunk down and climb inside the shell, you're really not going to be able to work in there. <laughs> yeah, so there's going to be some level of spaghetti, huh? Right. So we'll deal with that later. So I'm just trying to keep these as short as practical, um, but still give me a, and give myself enough room to work with. Yeah. So I guess at this point, though, it may also be worth mentioning that there's a lot of just connecting wires to lights and to speakers and whatnot. Right. And, and I also I also hooked up the speaker wires. These are the brown wires coming off the decoder. Those go to the brown wires that I put on the speaker mm -hmm. last episode. And those are just spliced with some heat shrink tubing. Yeah. All right. So I just wanted to mention that for the cab light and the number boards, I'm using 2K ohm resistors instead of 1K ohm resistors because these don't need to be as bright. Can't you change it with CVs though too? You can in the look sound, yeah, but I like to you know, help it along a little bit in the sure. wiring. Um, there's really no reason the number boards have to be that bright. Another thing I wanted to point out is there's two LEDs in the number boards and they're going to one output wire from the decoder, but I'm still using two resistors. Is it one for each? Or? Yeah. Generally, it's a good rule of thumb to use one resistor per LED, even if they're off the same wire. Because if you don't, sometimes you get strange results, like one will be brighter than the other or something weird like that. And I, I don't know why that happens. I'm sure somebody who has a better understanding of electrical engineering could explain it. But you won't have that problem if you just remember to use one resistor per LED. The blue wires um, are all ganged together. And these red wires are actually the um, positive leads from the uh, pre-wired LEDs that I used for the ditch lights. Pre-wired LEDs for the ditch lights. Yeah. For some reason, they were red and black instead of, you know. Yeah, because it, it's confusing now because you have I know different colors going to. I know. By convention, the positive uh, common from the decoder is blue. Uh -huh. And all I usually wire everything up to use blue. But the positive lead from the ditch light wires was red. Yeah. So it looks a little strange, but this is how it's supposed to be. And the 
this also includes uh, the green green wire from the uh, cab light because I when I get get that magnet wire that I use to hook those up, I haven't been able to find it in blue. Oh, I see. So I use green instead. Could you color it? Could you like put it on a piece of paper and just rub it with a blue marker or something? I suppose you could. I never tried that. Hmm. But anyway, so now um, I've actually um, tested everything and all the lights are operational. Yeah, I was going to say that uh, something that was happening off camera, not a lot of cussing, but a lot of happy sounds because as Dan was putting this together, each function was tested as it came on. And there was even some sound at one point. Yeah, um, I like to test this stuff as I go because when you have a lot of wires like this, it can get hard to troubleshoot later. Yeah. So I like to connect one wire and then test it and then connect another wire and test it. Yeah. It's a little tedious, but if you run into problems, they're a lot easier to address at the time. Right. So what I need to do now is neaten all this up so we can close up the model. Wow. It's getting so close to being done. Yeah. What I've done is I've tucked most of the wires up into the top of the shell and I've glued a couple of pieces of scrap O40 styrene okay. in there just to hold them down. Does does that hold the decoder in too? It'll hold the decoder in there. Hmm. And these are fairly easy to just grab and pull out if you needed to work on something. It's a lot neater this way. Yeah. So basically, I'm trying to keep all of the wiring up top where it's not going to interfere with anything. So all we have to worry about is this cable that comes down. Yeah. And now... The, the one I was referring to as the snake. Yeah. Oh, yeah, look at that. That's much neater because I've seen other models that you've done and there's a lot of stuff all... You have to, put, like, tape it down and it's pushing around. and So this is a lot neater. When I put a model together for the first time, like this, I like to give it a little test run. What I do is... The sound's not on, um, and I, I, I'll leave it that way because I'm listening when I run it to, to try to hear any rubbing, if anything's rubbing on the drive shafts. Like those wires? Yeah, you'll hear like a little, you know, or something like yeah, that it's... kind of a noise. The motor is kind of loud, but I don't the, hear any rubbing. Yeah, I don't hear any rubbing either. The motor's a little loud. That, that may um, fix itself later. <laughs> Anyway, it's uh, operating on its own. <laughs> this is another moment of truth. This is a milestone it is. right now. It's like Definitely it's graduating to, yeah. <laughs> to something. <laughs> right. <laughs> I'm going to program the sound decoder using my Loke programmer, and I'm going to install the sound set for an SD40-2, and... You can also use the Loke programmer software to set your CVs and do some of that kind of setup also. Does the Loke Sound Select give you the option to add your own sounds, or is that the other 4.0 or whatever? That's the, the 4.0. If you want to edit your own sounds, you have to use a 4.0. Um, but you can use any of the sounds that they have available on the Loke Sound website with a select. Okay. And generally, I find that that's fine for oh. my needs anyway. Yeah. I could just, you know, the reason I asked is I could just see myself, you know, if I was doing all this stuff for my for myself and I'd like put farts on it as the horn, you know, and stuff like that. <laughs> just yeah, well, you could, you could. <laughs> I actually have a Mac and the Loke programmer software is not uh, written for a Mac, it's written for Windows. So I actually have a piece of software called Parallels Desktop installed on my Mac, which allows me to run Windows on the Mac. Okay, so I've got my um, look programmer software open, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to click on uh, Open an Existing Decoder Project. And the project I'm going to open, when it is done thinking, <laughs> is um, I have Sound Files Select, and I think it's 7348. And we want the new version with the full throttle option. And that's this one. That's an EMD 645 prime mover with a 16-cylinder engine, which is what we need for an SD40-2. How, how do you know all this stuff? Uh, you download the right sound set you want from the Loke Sound uh, website. Right, but how, how do you know which one to pick? Uh, it gives you lists. 
And I also happen to know that an SD40-2 has a 645 engine in it. Okay, so you'd really have to do a little bit of research if you don't already know all that stuff, huh? Right. So here's the um, the screen you get when you open it up. And right now it's set to address number three. So I'm gonna, first thing I'm going to do is change that. I'm going to say use long address. And I'm going to type in 5126. Oh, so you're programming the the locomotive number address as well then, huh? Right. Yeah, you can program all of it this way. Um, and then I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to go ahead and say uh, write decoder data. And when you do this, it may want to update the firmware of the decoder, which is fine. Just let it. Um, so I'm just going to say next, and it'll write the decoder data. Yeah, updates are usually good for computer type stuff. Yeah, one of the things I really like about Loc Sounds is that they have firmware updates. So every time they come out with something new and better, you just update uh, your engine through the the software, and you don't have to change the decoder. Um, now I'm going to save this. I'm going to save as, okay, and I'm going to go into my saved settings folder, and I'm going to add um, to the original file name, I'm going to add ATSF5126 and save. And it's and I guess there's already a file with that name, so I'm just going to say yes, replace it. And now I have a file just for this engine. And now I'm going to tell it to write sound data. And this can take a little while, um, but this will actually upload the sound information into the decoder so that it will sound like an SD40-2. Quite cool. So that took a long time. Yeah, it takes a little while to write the sound memory the first time. Uh, well, actually, any time you change the sound set. Um, if you're just writing CVs, it doesn't take very long. So um, anyway, I'm going to go back out to the web just for a minute, and I'm going to look at the info on the sound file, which is the 645E3 full throttle. And I see that the Leslie RS3L is number six. Oh, is that how you decide which horn to, right. to, to program it with? Right, because Santa Fe used Leslie horns for the most part. Um, so I'm going to go back out here. Sound settings, here we go. So I'm going to change this number to six where it says select sound configuration number. Yeah. Now you could do this with your hand controller thing too, right? You can. You can program all the CVs with your hand controller, but I just find it easier to do it this way. Yeah, I totally get that. It would um, be for me too. And the other thing I like about this is um, you can save this file. So if you ever have to reprogram the engine, all your settings are all here. Uh-huh. So, um, so if you fry, fried your decoder, you could put a new one in and just read. Exactly. So let's go to uh, function outputs. Whoops, here we go. So headlight front, set to dimmable headlight, fade in and out, brightness is full. That's fine. Headlight rear, same thing. Okay, ditch light. I'm actually going to set this to be dimmable headlight, fade in and out. The reason for that is because I don't want the the lights to flash um, the uh, Santa Fe didn't have flashing ditch lights so we're just going to set it to dim and fade in and out what that fade in and out means is that when you hit the on on button or, or whichever key you've got assigned to control that light rather than just turn on in an instant it kind of slowly fades in and then slowly fades out when you turn it off. I think it's kind of a neat setting because it looks more like a bulb. Yeah, does si simulating you... a light bulb. Right. Now, three is rotary beacon. Well, three we don't have um, as a rotary beacon. I think three is the number boards. So I'm going to set this as dimmable headlight fade in and out, and I'm going to change this name to number boards. And I'll set the brightness lower. Let's try 12, see what that looks like. And then auxiliary four is going to be the cab light, so I'll change that name too. And 
And again, I'll set this to fade in and out. And I'll set the brightness that to about 12 also. And now function mapping. Got our headlight on F0. Function one is a bell. Function two is the horn. Function three is coupler, but I don't like that. So I'm gonna get rid of that. And I'll save that slot for something else. Uh, function four is dynamic break. I'm gonna get rid of shift mode because I think that makes the engine drive slower. Uh, function five is number boards, that's fine. Function six is ditch lights, that's also fine. Uh, function seven is switching mode, which also makes the engine go slower without momentum. I don't like that, so I'm going to turn it off. Uh, function eight is the motor noise. That's fine. Uh, function nine is drive hold, which has something to do with the full throttle thing. I'll leave that for now. Um, and function 13 is the cab light, which I guess I will leave for now. Um, actually, no. I'm going to get rid of that. Well, why would you get rid of it? You have a cab light, don't you want to? Yeah, but I want to put it on F10 because oh. it's a little more easy to access that way. I'm going to get rid of this independent brake sound over here. And I get rid of this radiator fan sound over here. I don't use a lot of these uh, extra sounds they have personally, um, just my preference. And... Uh, so that should set up the function key assignments. And let's go ahead and write the decoder data. Oh, so now it's going to transfer through the track into the decoder? Right. This won't take very long because it's just writing CVs, not the whole sound set. Oh, I see. So all that stuff uploaded into the, into the chip already when you did what, you, what took the long time. Now all you're doing is assigning stuff for what's already inside the chip, right? Right. Okay, that and makes a lot more sense now because I didn't understand why it took so long the first time. Right, and I'll go ahead and save the file. And then uh, let's look at the motor settings. Uh, now, I like a linear curve. This is setting, this is for CV2, and I like the value for that to be 1. Uh, the other two will kind of depend on how when I in, ultimately end up speed matching it to my other engines. But for now... I'm going to set this to a linear curve. So let's set this one, this middle one to 80. This would be CV6. Linear curve is kind of a contradiction, isn't it? Well, yeah. And let's set this one to about one. Contradiction in terms. 80 and 80 is what, 160? 80 and 80, yeah. Yeah, so that, that makes right. a nice straight line. I, I personally don't see any reason to ever use anything but a linear speed curve because it's very intuitive and straightforward. Um, and I don't really, I mean, there's, I don't, I don't know, other people may have different preferences, but that's my preference. So I'm going to just do that. Dan, it's your model. It's okay. Yeah. <laughs> and, oh, this is the sound slot settings where you can adjust the volumes. Uh, I don't, I'm not going to play with this too much right now. Um, you could probably turn the bell volume down a little. Let's turn it down to about 32. Um, anyway, you can go through all of the different um, sound settings that they have and adjust the volumes individually. And let's go back to that function outputs and let's go to number board. Oh, I already, yeah, I already changed the brightness. Okay, so let's go ahead and save this and then write decoder data and let's see where that gets us with the engine. Okay, so I'm going to use the driver's cab feature of the Loke programmer to run the engine. Um, this is a good way to test it. And let's turn the light on. The light's on. Looks like it's on. Ditch lights. Ditch lights are on. Ditch lights are on. Number boards. Can't tell. It's I'm too, pretty sure they're on. It's too bright um, in here. And that should be the... Wait. Here, let me check if the ditch lights are on. I mean, the yeah, the number boards are on. 
Okay, there's the cab light. It seems to be momentary for some reason on this particular uh, software, but it is turning on and off. I see it. Well, what do you mean by momentary? It comes on and then turns itself off. I have to hold. Um, I have to hold the the button down. Here, let's see if we can get a a clear look at the. Do it again. Oh, there it is. Yeah, it's yeah. pretty bright too. That looks neat. Yeah, that looks really neat. Do it. Do it again. It's on, off, on. It's kind of hard for the off. for the camera to see. Yeah, let's try. It's a horn. Bell. Let's try the uh, engine noise. Sounds about right. Yeah. And you can run it with this. God, look at that low speed control. Jeez. This is a little preview of what we're going to do, huh? Yeah. So anyway, things appear to be uh, working. I'll go ahead and shut it off. There. <laughs> um, it got so quiet in here suddenly. Yeah, it was. it's a little loud because that's pretty much the full blast default volume. But um, anyway, um, seems to be uh, working pretty well. And... Uh, may need to be tweaked. I still need to speed match it, which is something I'll have to do uh, with another engine that I want it to match to. I think that's probably a good place to stop for now. Okay. This thing is uh, running. The lights work. And it's Speaker, pretty much yeah. operational. Speaker works. Speaker works. Everything, sounding pretty good. Everything's working. Yeah. So uh, all that's really left is to put on all the details that go on the outside like the handrails and the antennas and all that um and the couplers of course um because it wouldn't wouldn't be much of a locomotive without couplers gotta weather it huh? weather it yeah and that's pretty much it so i think we have what then maybe two chapters left we're gonna weather yeah maybe one or two it depends on how how we do it okay well i guess we'll we'll find out next next time we have a show we'll we'll find out if it's the last one or not yeah all right, we'll catch everybody then. All right.